Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. And thank you all for inviting me to talk to you today. I'm um, based in Columbia, Missouri. And uh, so a little bit of background about me. Um, I worked for the Missouri's Office of State Court Administrators for um, over a decade. I was I managed the research office there. And um, before and after that, I was a research faculty at the University of Missouri. And I started doing research on drug treatment courts in the late 90s, actually. So I've been um, doing research on them for a very long time. And the topic that really... Um, spoke to me was looking at, at disparities, racial disparities in treatment courts. And I did a study in the that was published in 2006 on that topic. And it was one of the first that had ever been done. There have been a few others before that, but not many. And it kind of helped launch this whole focus in at the national level, actually, on um, equity and treatment courts. And it's it's I'm I'm retired now um, from from the state and from the university, uh, but I still do a lot of work around equity and treatment courts around the country. And I will tell you that this is the um, first opportunity I've had to specifically talk to defense attorneys about your role, but that doesn't mean I haven't been having conversations with defense attorneys about, about their role. So I hope you find this um, pr presentation today helpful and informative and and I also wanna to say too, that I recognize that um, different programs have different models for how they incorporate defense attorneys. Sometimes you are on a contract and you have a limited amount of time that you are available to work with clients in the treatment court. And other times you work exclusively within the context of the treatment court. And I, and I know that. And, and so I, I hope that you find some ideas today that you can take and put into practice based on your particular situation. So what we're going to do today is highlight some strategies that defense attorneys can employ to reduce inequities in access and retention and treatment courts. And this is across the gamut of treatment courts. Uh, so we're gonna very briefly review what's been done at the national level, mainly through the National Association of Drug Court Professionals to enhance equity and inclusion. And then we'll look at some system and client level strategies that you might be able to employ in your own program to ensure that your clients have a, have a chance to participate in the program and successfully complete it. So first of all, why do we need to emphasize equity? Well, the purpose of treatment court is to support justice-involved individuals in recovering from a substance use disorder and address any criminogenic behavior that they might have. And individuals who successfully complete the program are generally likely to have reduced recidivism and are able to maintain sobriety compared to other individuals in similar kind of background, but not going through the program. But the benefits and results as a diversion from incarceration have not been experienced the same across all groups in our population. So some of the disparities, and this is based on data that was collected um, by the National Drug Court Institute where they surveyed programs around the country to get statistics and then they compiled them for this summary. 62% of drug court participants are white compared to about 32% of the incarcerated population. 17% of participants are black compared to 37% of the prison population and 10% are Hispanic compared to 22% of the prison population, indicating a, a um, underrepresentation of people of color in treatment courts. And then among those who graduate, well, 58% graduate overall among black individuals, the average rate was 39% as reported by the programs that responded to the survey and 32% were Hispanic. Now there hasn't been a whole lot of research done on women, but here's what I can tell you. In general, women have a higher proportion who participate in treatment court than in prison. But from a study that I and a colleague did, um, what we found in, in one Midwestern state was that the, that black women had a lower rate of graduation than white women, 37% versus 
So these are some of the kinds of inequities that the statistics show us exist. So then our task is to, is to help to enhance equity, to, in, to bring up the number and the proportion of individuals into the programs that are, who are currently underserved and to make sure they complete the program successfully. So why equity? With what, if we treat everyone the same, we'll get results something like the first one, where because people come into our programs with different backgrounds, different needs, different cultures, if we all, if everyone's treated the same, some people will be able to, as in this example, see over the fence, but others won't. But if instead we recognize that when people come in, their life experiences are different, their needs, their culture, the way their ways of being are all different. So we treat them differently. We give different levels of resources and services to help them meet their needs. Then everyone has a chance to see what's happening. So let's look now at what NADCP has done to support programs to enhance equity. First of all, in 2010, which is over a decade ago now, the board of directors um, issued a resolution saying that all drug courts have an, an affirmative obligation to examine whether there are any racial or ethnic disparities in their programs. And in fact, if they find any, they are ob obligated to take reasonable action to prevent or correct these disparities. But with that resolution, we need some resources, some support to programs, of course. And so a best practice guide was, was um, published and it's currently um, being uh, revised um, as we speak, by the way. Um, but chapter two of that about involved addressing equity and inclusion. And, and, the, and it stated that um, everyone needs to be given an equal opportunity as long if they're eligible to participate regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or any other background characteristic and that we need to take steps to detect and correct any disparities and that we need, and teams need to be responsive to cultural differences. And the standard included research that had been published around each of these different items, but it wasn't, it was still was kind of honestly short on specifics. So um, I was the, the um, author of an equity and inclusion toolkit, which you can access um, on, um, on the internet, and it is a guide to help programs understand um, who's getting in their programs, why are they getting in or not getting in, and what to do about it. And it also includes a section on social marketing as a new way to think about your program and how it might be helpful. So other resources that have been made available include um, workshops. Each year we do uh, two, two and a half day workshops with the, all the members of teams to focus on equity, on first identifying who your underserved population is, um, looking at some of the reasons why they may be underserved, coming up with a plan to address the inequities that, uh, that exist. And then about three to six months after the workshops, I, I give a follow-up call to provide some coaching to the teams on, on how, how to implement their plan and what, what more they need to do and what kind of resources they may need to do that. Along with that, one of the things that we had recommended was that um, you market your program to people that don't know about it. And we created a sample brochure, I'll show it to you in here in just a second, to, uh, to, that can be used um, and, and modified to specific programs. And also we um, provided a model intake script to, to explain and demonstrate to programs how to use a client-centered voice to help people um, understand more about your program and to feel um, include, inclu included and uh, welcome into the program. And then we've also started doing webinars um, based on what we find is needs of the programs that have been through the program. And so I have listed here what the topics were for last year. I don't know what they'll be yet this year, um, but you can see the different um, topics. And then there is um, going to be shortly a monograph for defense attorneys um, that, who work in drug treatment courts. And that will be released, I believe, at the national conference this summer. 
So here's the here's um, one page of the brochure. It's a, it's two complete pages. Um, it, it's you can fill in for your local program the pictures, anything you want to say gives you some models of what to say. And this is can be downloaded from the National Drug Court Institute website. So defense attorney role now shifting to that. In 2018, NPC research reviewed data from 142 treatment courts across the United States. And, and they were trying to answer these two questions. First, are there disparities in who graduates from treatment courts? And indeed, they found, they found there were, that um, in some programs, um, black individuals were more likely to graduate and others, they were less likely than white people. And the same held true for Hispanic individuals. Those were the groups they had the most data on to um, include in their research. And then they looked at practices related to decreasing disparities. And I won't go through all of them, but the ones that are most germane to you all, of course, are related to defense attorneys. Courts where a defense attorney attends staffing showed half the disparity in graduation rates. And um, when the defense attorney attends court sessions, there, there were four times less disparities in graduation rates. So we'll be looking at some things you can do. What is it that, that um, happens when the defense attorney attends staffings? What happens when they attend court sessions that might help us understand why there's a difference in the success rate of individuals of color going through your programs? So first we'll look at system level strategies. Um, and, and in brief, we're, we'll look at um, what you can do to examine your process of accessing your program, um, how to compile some, some basic statistics. And I will recognize that in some of the programs we've worked with, and we work with many now, it is the defense attorney who takes the lead in compiling those statistics um, and analyzing them to understand where there are disparities. We'll look at some of the reasons possibly for the disparities. Um, we'll um, take a minute to visit validated screening and assessment tools to understand better what they are, how they can be used and helpful, and examine el both eligibility and exclusionary criteria and how they can have a differ differential impact on certain groups. So first of all, examining your admission process, an inverted triangle. This, this is a typical kind of um, process flow for programs from some event where it may be an arrest or it could even be a, um, a dis disposition on a case, whatever it is, a trigger an event that, that where an individual gets considered for your program. And for whatever reason, as on the right side shows, um, the case is not examined. And then the next thing that often happens is a paper eligibility screening. Maybe it's the defense or it could be the prosecuting attorney who, who look at the paper files and decide this person's eligible, this one's not. And imagine that you have this stack of cases and it starts out back in the day of paper files. You have this really big, tall stack. And then with each of these steps, it gets smaller and smaller. And so there's a, there's a screening process. There may be an assessment process, or there will be at some point, and then an admission decision. And each of those steps, less and less people are included. But then also, if you notice on the left side, there's another way that people exit. And it's the ones on the right side are could mainly be based on objective criteria. But on the left side, all along through this whole decision process, there could be beliefs, biases, in fact, about why someone's not suitable for a program that leads to people um, not being considered and admitted to the program. So let's look at this a little bit more. So first, some background on the access process. Why is it this inverted triangle? Well, research has been done looking at, at, the, at this decision process. About 5% of potentially eligible, based on a drug charge anyway, um, individuals actually are admitted to drug court. Of those screened and found eligible, about a third are admitted, a third rejected, and a third refused to participate. Of those not admitted, some were incarcerated, some placed on community supervision, and others went into an alternative treatment program, maybe for mental health court or something else. And so you, that's, that's a, a numerical summary of 
why we have this inverted triangle. So what can we do then to, to better understand this process? Well, um, we need to compile statistics to identify who's underserved. And what do I mean by underserved? It, it refers to groups who have historically faced discrimination because of some aspect of their lives, such as race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, immigration status, whatever it is. And, and honestly, we know what we know because we collect data on it. And there are some as characteristics of individuals where that we probably don't have very good data um, and such as sexual orientation. Um, although we're becoming more aware of the need to, and importance of collecting that information too. But we, based on what we know, we know that there are certain groups who have faced discrimination. A defining characteristic of an underserved group is that they, are particip they participate in a culture which shapes many aspects of their life, including ones relevant to our treatment court, such as how one perceives and copes with an illness. And we'll talk more when we get to individual level factors uh, about culture and how it can impact an individual. So what you'll wanna do is look at your jurisdiction, identify the distinct groups who are in the justice system, groups who could be identified by characteristics tied to a culture, and then look at your treatment program to see if they are represented among the participants, as well as by staff and agencies working with the program. So that's a, let's me telling you, now let me show you a sample description of how to do this. So for a recent one year period, you will want to collect data. Um, and this, is, this, isn't, this isn't drilling down to get real specific at, at first. If you've never done this before, I urge you to do what I would call a quick and dirty analysis, which might mean starting out with drug cases, filed or disposed. I know in the state of Missouri, when I was working for the court administrator's office, we looked at um, how, how realistic it was to make an estimate based on drug cases. And we did find that about 30% of people who came into our treatment court programs did not have a drug charge as, a prime, as their primary charge. But it, as an estimate, it worked pretty well. And then based on your, where, where people in their court process are able to enter your program, you might wanna pick filed cases or disposed cases. And then look at the number of admissions you have to your program. And I'm using an example here for women of um, rape by race ethnicity. So in this example, for black women, there were 50 who in the past year had um, a drug charge filed. And in that same year period, not necessarily the same um, from the same group of women because of the how long it takes to get through the process, but for a quick estimate, there were five, five women, five black women admitted to the program. So dividing those two numbers gives us a, an admission chance of 10% versus for white women in this example, 25%. This is really useful information to have because then you can start to ask questions. Well, is that okay? Is it acceptable that there is that big difference? Why is there a difference? Is it because maybe the black women are going into family treatment court or is it because of the kind of charge they have or is it because they don't want to get in the program? Just what's happening? So the other thing you can do is um, if you don't wanna create your own spreadsheet, we also have a tool available on the website from the National Drug Court Institute um, where it's a fillable Excel spreadsheet you can download and it, it includes um, the um, guide for compiling information by race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and, and then helps you to, to generate those statistics to look at your program. So that's something else that you might wanna do related to statistics. So then you, once you have those statistics, you see there's a difference between, between admission chances. The next step is to identify reasons for disparities in access. When someone enters the door, the door to the justice system, which door is it they're going in? Is it the door to your treatment court? Is it the door to community supervision, an alternative program, or the door to the prison? We wanna know that. We wanna know why they may not be entering our program. Make sure that there's not some kind of bias, some kind of 
discrimination. So one thing to look at is what are your program requirements? Do they somehow exclude certain groups from participating? For example, if one if your program um, allows um, parents, which it probably does, but it requires that they find their own child care, that might be a reason why someone can't enter your program. There may also be exclusionary criteria that um, that ex that keep certain people out and may also um, then exclude people um, in certain demographic groups. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Or there could be some kind of subjectivity that the, those true believers that think I don't need objective data to know who's gonna be appropriate for this program. And we'll talk more about that too here in a minute. So program requirements. One of them that can have a differential impact is transportation requirements based on the community or the neighborhood where potential participants live, they may or may not easily be able to access your program services. I had one program I worked with where individuals had to go all over a very um, spread out community to access the court, the probation office, the place where they did screenings, the place where they did assessments. And so as part of the workshop we did with them, we discussed, well, how could, we, how could some of those services be consolidated? So instead of having to go to two to four different places, they could just go to one place and get everything done. And that's what they, that's what they did. And it started to lead to um, much better participation. Another, another um, requirement is that you, usually you have to pay fees to be in the treatment court. And for some people, especially at first, those fees may really be onerous and, and, and a barrier to them because they are, their, their level of income is so low that they, they can't afford the fees. And then housing status is another one. How do, how do we, oops, sorry. Let me go back here. There, sorry. Um, housing status is another one where um, if we require people to have stable housing, the fact is they may not have stable housing or it may what their version of stable housing is may not look like what we would expect. And working through that as, a, as an attorney, maybe understanding how a client views their housing as stable and then advocating for that. Or as an attorney, raising the need for, for, for safe, stable housing for your clients and, and helping come up with a solution may be something you can do. Then exclusionary criteria. In that toolkit I mentioned earlier, the Equity and Inclusion Toolkit, there is a research brief that looks at exclusionary criteria and how they, how they impact likelihood of reoffending, racial bias, and outcomes in treatment court. So for example, a common exclusionary criteria is having a weapons charge. What some programs have done is they realize well, that has been excluding um, a lot of black individuals from our program because they live in dangerous neighborhoods. And sometimes they, carry, they have to carry a weapon for defense purposes. And so they, they sometimes programs have the opportunity to look at a case by case basis at, at the, the circumstances around that weapons charge to see if it was really something that was, um, that, uh, involving a violent act, or if it was more for defense, and and they've let people into their program um, who had a weapons charge. But there's others like such as sex trafficking. Sometimes that is a an exclusionary criteria. Um, but revisiting some of those and looking at what groups they impact um, may may help you identify ways to um, to be more inclusive. And then another thing that is that subjectivity is often used in determining who will be referred and admitted to the program. You remember from the inverted triangle that on the left side, there's that leakage of people um, because someone um, has, some, has a belief about, about maybe certain aspects of the individual's circumstances that, um, and they believe that the person won't be appropriate for the program. So what can we do? Um, implicit bias training, encouraging that is something that um, 
many, many programs are doing and many courts are requiring anymore. That, that certainly builds awareness, but then there's other actionable items we can do. For example, at staffings, have um, sometimes at staffings, um, we can get into discussions that really get into subjectivity. Oh, I know that family, they're no good. Um, so this person's not gonna do well in this program. Or sometimes it, this, the discussion involves more that we just, there's somebody that's not very likable that's in our program. And, and so we tend to be biased and make subjective decisions, maybe judging them more harshly than other individuals. So what some programs have done to become more aware of when they're doing this is they, they um, appoint someone to be a devil's advocate to raise a red flag if, if the decisions move into subjective areas, into biases, and, and to question the decisions and the nature of the discussions. Another thing to do is um, to look at your admission process. And when it comes to your program staff uh, determining who's gonna get in your program, do you, have a, do you have a staffing where you discuss applications and decide who's suitable for your program and who's not? That is an area that's really rife for subjectivity and bias. I know what some programs have done, they've eliminated that staffing. And instead they list out the criteria, seven or eight criteria. If you meet these criteria, you get in this program. And I know one program in particular that did that and they found um, it, they had a remarkable increase in the number of black men admitted to their program. And along with that, um, an increase in those who successfully graduated. And then check beliefs with evidence and data. I showed you some, um, some, inf some data, some statistics you can compile. Um, it's if anyone questions, well, I think we're, you know, we're admitting, we're giving everyone a fairest chance in admitting them. Um, you can also, um, you can, one piece of data you can use is a, your screening tools. So what's the difference between a screening and an assessment tool? I wanna um, pause and just clarify that for a minute. A screening tool is something brief. In Missouri, we use the risk and need triage tool. It's a um, basic, I think it's 19 item tool that a non-clinician can do, it administer. Uh, so it may be a probation officer, court administrator, someone else in the court who administers the screening and, they, and that information is then used to make a preliminary analysis of the risk and need level of an individual to determine if they are in fact high risk and high need. And then later there are clinical assessments done. Assessments are done by clinicians. They require a much higher level of, of training than, uh, than the other people who aren't um, clinicians will have most likely. And, but that first screening can be really critical to help us make a quick, um, a quick identification of who's appropriate for a program and who isn't. And then the second thing that's important is to understand how a tool is validated. Ideally, we want the tool, our screening tools to be validated using the local population, but that can take years because you have to collect data using the tool and other data too sometimes on um, enough individuals, which can take numerous years to collect. And then you also have to follow through with those individuals for a couple years to, um, to gather information about their recidivism rate. And then once you have all that, so it can easily be at least a three-year process, then you can do the statistical analysis to see if your tool is indeed unbiased regarding um, race and gender um, and for your local population. But in the meantime, um, you can rely on the results of um, other, from other areas that have already done validations. And why is it important to use these tools? Well, so you don't have individuals say like this next statement, I don't have an addiction, it's more of a lifestyle. In Missouri, before we used the risk and need triage tool, we were finding that we had a lot of, especially younger black men who did not succeed in the program. And it was those gentlemen who were making statements like this. Well, guess what? When we started using the, the rant to screen people, we found out that in fact, they were high risk, but low need. They didn't have a substance use disorder. 
And so they really weren't suitable for our treatment court. Subjectivity often leads to unconscious bias and contributes to inequities and in admission decisions. This was a result of a research study looking at um, comparing people who, who believed that they had, based on all their years of experience, they knew who was suitable for the program and who wasn't, and comparing their decision, admission decisions to that of an objective tool. The objective tool wins out. Another thing you can do in the way of compiling information and statistics to understand why people aren't being admitted is to track your reasons for non-admission and break it out again by your significant demographic groups. We did this in Missouri, and what we found was that um, the, the highest proportion of black men and women who were not admitted, um, that it was the result of a prosecutor decision. We showed that data to the prosecutors. They were really shocked. It was not their intention at all. They were unaware of that. And they started um, looking more closely at their practices and their decision process. And that really helped them um, to, to see a little bit more clearly what areas where they could, um, they could do better. And this is the sort of thing, it, it's labor intensive. Um, I would encourage you if you're interested in, in doing this, and, and to do it for a time limited period, say three or four months, and see if the results are helpful. And if they are, then maybe you can institutionalize it or maybe not, but, it's, it's, but at least start out doing it short term. So to, to summarize, um, system level kinds of changes. To ensure that everyone has a, that everyone eligible has an equivalent opportunity to enter the program and to succeed, we can be advocates for system level changes, changes in our admission process, in, in um, who's involved in making the decisions, the, the timeline, the requirements for admission, any of those sorts of things, or look at um, the information that's used to make the referrals and admission decisions. There was, we had one program where the prosecutor had um, excluded um, men below the age of 25 because she didn't believe they would do well in the program. Well, the rest of the program um, staff didn't know that, that she was using that as an exclusionary criteria. And, uh, and, so the, and they were shocked. And, uh, and at, a, at the workshop that we held with them, they made a decision uh, to work with the prosecutor, who was, of course, there at the meeting, at the workshop, um, to, to eliminate that criteria. So um, being aware of that, changing the kind of information you use to make those decisions can help increase the level of individuals from different groups in your program. And always relying more on statistics, um, even though we can also say statistics, those numbers only tell part of the story, like in the example of the admission chance of 5% for Black women, 25% um, for white women or whatever it was, you know, that's that's part of the story, but then the rest of the story is why is there a difference? And sometimes adding more services to meet client needs are what's, what's going to be beneficial. And as an advocate for your clients, understanding, getting to know them, you may be able to um, be the one leading the charge for those new services. So now let's, let's turn to looking at clients. At the client level, what can we do? We work with individuals. And a lot of those system level strategies come into play at staffings, court staffings, where you have conversations with the rest of the staff. So in brief, um, we, it's important to identify, well, what does the client want? Why would they get into treatment court? What, how would it meet their needs, their, their desired outcomes? Um, because we need, to meet, we need to match clients to what's the best option for them. We need to be able to um, incorporate culture be aware of it, understand it. I'll give you some examples. Um, there, there are some themes I will introduce to, to potentially explore with clients related to um, aspects of their life that may impact their, their desire to be in treatment court, their belief that they can complete treatment court. And then we'll briefly revisit um, procedural justice. So identifying client outcomes is, is important. Because as um, I, I've conducted um, focus groups um, with black drug court participants, um, black men, 
um, to find out more about their experience in treatment courts. And um, one of the things they said was, well, I know it's called drug court, but drugs are not the main problem for a lot of us. It's no job, it's no education, it's being a black man with a felony record. So there's other things that we really um, would like to work on. So for your clients, finding out well, what is it that they want? Um, maybe a more viable economic pathway. What, what the men in the focus groups told me was that they would like a, a pathway to a career. And some programs have now started being more, more intentional about linking their participants to vocational educational programs, to technical colleges, to job coaching, other things to, to start them on that pathway. Um, they may be interested in improved overall health status, just feeling better in, in their bodies. Um, they may need um, links to um, health care providers. Some programs have been able to include on their staff um, a health care provider, a public health nurse or something like that. And sometimes they want better relationships with family and in their community. So listening to our clients, finding out what their outcomes are so that we can advocate for them and help them identify the best option to meet those outcomes. And also to um, meet their need for services. You may have other pro diversion programs besides drug court in, in your community. You may have mental health courts. You may have a, a DUI treatment program, other options as well. So finding the one that works best um, in your community may be something that you can help your clients do. Um, a reminder here, drug court, the 10 key component drug court is designed for individuals with a high risk for continued criminal behavior and a high need for clinical treatment. So following the results of the risk and need screening to match clients to appropriate programs is really important for their outcomes. And probably the number one thing is, is identifying a client's need for substance um, use disorder treatment. Um, and that will help you and them decide if, if being in a treatment court is the best option for them or not. And something else to consider here in under the high risk for continued criminal behavior, um, one, look at your eligibility criteria and um, how many prior felonies is considered um, for inclusion in your program versus exclusion. If it's less than three, they're probably not a high risk individual. If they're seven, they're, that's high risk. They should probably, they should be considered um, if, if um, everything else um, checks out for other in eligibility criteria. So, so some programs were only allowing um, individuals with less than, with three or less felonies, and they're not really serving the population they need to be serving, are they, when they do that? So make sure that your programs, check the number of felonies. Post admission, um, also continue to advocate for your client needs. Does, the, does treatment include addressing any trauma? We'll talk some more about trauma here in a minute because if you if they stop using their substance, um, how are they how are they treating their trauma? Uh, is it it needs to be addressed? And then sanctions and incentives, or what I would call behavioral responses, do they really help your clients? That's something that you can advocate for in staffing and you can talk to your clients too. So you got, um, the judge gave you a, a sanction for um, a be behavior. What, what was that like for you? What was the experience like? How did it impact you? Did it motivate you to change your behavior? Did it help you in some way? So understanding from the client perspective what's happening with those experiences and then taking that back to the team for feedback can, can uh, be something that'll benefit your clients. And then the program staff, are they knowledgeable about your clients' daily lives? Do they, do they have a, uh, an understanding, um, the kind of understanding that you yourself get when you talk one-on-one -on -one with your clients about what it's like in, for them, um, what it's like for them to open their door and step out and walk down, walk down the road. 
Um, one participant said, in my neighborhood, there's no opportunity to be productive. There's lots of drug dealers around, um, that sort of thing, but there's no grocery stores. There's, you don't see people working. And then recognize the role of culture in your clients' lives. And some program staff say, we treat everyone the same. Then the participants say, this program lacks cultural relevance, culture, ways of being. Let me give you a, 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 um, a fictitious example of what I'm talking about here. So we have Diego. He's a, a young Hispanic man, and he's in our treatment court. And he misses one appointment. So the judge gives him a, a sanction to write a paper about um, why it's important to always uh, attend your meetings or your appointments. And he does that. And then he misses three more appointments. So then the staff's like, well, what do we do? Well, um, somebody, maybe it's you as the attorney, um, talk to Diego to find out what's going on in his life. And you come to understand that he comes from a, a home that has a traditional Hispanic value of familissimo or um, a, a, a priority focus on the well-being of the family above the well-being of individuals. And so Diego fully intended to make all those meetings, but someone in his house each time had something happen and Diego felt it was more important to look out for the well-being of that family member because that's where his culture is attuned, the, the well-being of family over individual. So what would, might be beneficial to Diego is to have a meeting with treatment court staff, some of his, his members of his family and himself, so that um, the family can, can let Diego know how disruptive his behavior is and give him permission to take care of himself and not, not worry so much about the family. And then as an incentive um, for, for making a month of meetings as a result of this, this change in the outlook, um, offering him a, a card for pizza, which is um, then he could provide dinner to the whole family and once again, be attuned to his culture. So that's an example of how culture can come into play um, for individuals. And there's many more. So themes to explore around culture could include perspectives on illness and recovery. I um, have done research on um, family life in sending and receiving communities in the Midwest um, for new settlement communities related, related to immigration. So I was at, I was at a, um, a mass in a small town in Chihuahua and the priest at, at the um, homily said, we're put on this earth not to recover from illness, that's not what determines our entrance to heaven, but it's, it's um, how well we endure the illness over the course of our life that determines whether or not we make it into heaven. It's a very different perspective than people have um, in conventional um, medicine in the United States. And so listen to your clients and what they say about what ails them and what needs to be done about it to help you understand and then advocate for their needs. Talk to them about their pathways to substance use and how they view the recovery pathway. It may be very different than the traditional Western view of it. It may include elements of a spirit, for example. And then help them find cultural resources for recovery. For some individuals, being better connected to their culture of origin may help them access resources that they can use. So for example, um, one program that is um, available is HEAT, um, which is a program that's designed for um, in men who identify with the culture of young black males. And it's a cognitive behavioral therapy. It's been um, proven very successful um, in helping them address the, the issues that are related to, um, to their life experiences and helping them overcome them. Um, and um, so that is a program for that culture. It is right now the only program um, for individuals um, of, of a specific um, race um, that I'm aware of anyway. Um, some other kinds of issues to explore with clients are their struggles 
not only their struggles with addiction, mental health and stuff, but they're and such, but um, the kind of experience they had in trying to address them in the justice system and the healthcare system. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that from a research perspective in a moment. And then um, how have they experienced discrimination in accessing and trying to access services in tracking in the educational system? in um, limited grocery stores in their neighborhoods, all those sorts of things help by understanding more about a client's experiences and the struggles they've had can help us be a more effective advocate for them. So one thing that doesn't get talked about a lot is um, race-based traumatic stress. Racial discrimination is characterized by hostility, which could be things like verbal assaults, disrespect, uh, or it could be characterized by avoidance, denying someone services based on the color of their skin, such as with housing policies for a while, um, or sometimes still now, frankly, um, and or adversive hostility, where people act as though they're intimidated. That's that individual that walks across the other side of the street rather than encounter an individual. And mental health and psychology fields have largely ignored racism, discrimination, their impacts on mental health. Events that are associated with race-based traumatic stress are perceived as emotionally painful, sudden or unexpected, and uncontrollable. For example, you're a black woman at a, um, who works in an office. You've received outstanding reviews, um, recommendations and such. There's a position coming open above yours um, and you fully expect to get it. Other people in the office expect you to get it too. And instead, the position's given to a younger white man. You had absolutely no control over that. It was um, totally unexpected and, and it hurts to have been looked overlooked be, um, for someone else. And that can lead to race-based traumatic stress. So what do we do? What can we do? Um, one thing is to create um, homogeneous support groups where you, um, individuals from a, from a common background, common culture can talk about their experiences, the, the pain related to it. And, um, and, and sometimes, um, I know this has happened in Missouri, we, had, um, we have a lot of small rural programs around the state. And um, they did not have enough um, individuals of a particular, from a particular background to form a group um, within the program. And so uh, there was a treatment provider who created an online um, support groups for them, sometimes um, in the virtual world, sometimes using um, something like a, plat a virtual platform. And that, that was something that was found to be beneficial. So you can be an advocate again if you find clients that have that sort of the need for um, some culturally, um, a cultural support group. Um, so looking a little bit at uh, some of the other, some, some kinds of themes that you may encounter. Um, there's a deficit of trust in the justice system for many people of color, which I'm sure we're all aware of. Um, the first example talks about the discrimination of being stopped because you're tall, black, and have short hair. The second experience, so I wanna really um, highlight, um, when you've been arrested and locked up, you get used to a system. People enter drug court with the idea it's just like the rest of the system. There's unconscious distrust of anybody in authority positions. So your clients may be in this mindset that I've been through the court system, it's really unjust, unfair, treatment courts just like it, so we can help them understand that it is different than the rest of the system. And working with the other members of your treatment team to identify the benefits of the program, and maybe identifying how your program is different than the rest of the system is something that you might be able to lead. And then there's also um, a well-founded distrust in the healthcare system. People of color report lower levels of satisfaction with treatment. And so this definitely gets into um, that very critical aspect of our treatment courts, the clinical treatment that people are to receive. People of color underutilize treatment because of potential stigma 
already feeling maybe discriminated against, stigmatized based on the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, whatever it is. So they don't want further stigma by being identified as someone in need of substance use treatment. A well-founded distrust of providers. You're probably very familiar with the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, but you may not be as familiar with how the field of modern gynecology was developed. Um, during times of enslaved peoples in the United States, um, the bodies of black women were experimented on to come up with the, the practices of modern gynecology. So there's well-founded distrust of providers. Another thing that can impact your, your clients is their experiences um, in their neighborhoods, in their communities. They may have a low sense of self-efficacy. They may not believe that they are a person that can enter a program that seems so hard and complete it. And they may not really understand the benefits of staying in treatment. So we can talk with them and help them understand how the program may help them and how, how they can, with the, how they can get through, what resources, supports are available to help them. And then we also need to make sure that we either, either us or other staff um, really understand the daily lives of our participants. What it's like, as I said before, to open their door and walk out. How they get to the program, services, that sort of thing. So we need to be sure to recognize that discrimination and its role in um, substance use and coping to recognize the prevalence uh, still of historical traumas that, that the times of enslaved peoples, there's still a legacy of it today. And the trauma lives on, um, it's generationally passed on. Um, I have an image here from um, Aunt Jemima Pancake Company, which has been removed finally because they, they recognized in the last couple of years that this is um, a traumatic image for people because it relates back to the times of enslavement. So we can advocate for assessing for race-based traumatic stress on the part of clinicians and offering a cl culturally homogeneous support group for people. So where do clients live? I mentioned that a couple of times. A research study was done where um, resources uh, or characteristics of neighborhoods were compiled. And what the researcher found was that the more um, under-resourced a neighborhood, the less likely an individual was to graduate from drug court. So why is that? How do resources matter in a neighborhood in determining success in our programs? Well, a lot of there's, um, you may be aware of the fact that may, many neighborhoods are still segregated. You can, um, Google um, your community and um, say, Google um, my community uh, racial segregation map. And you'll most likely get a map showing where do people live based on race and ethnicity and it tends, there tends to be clustered. And that creates differences in the resources available. The one I wanna really underscore today is self and collective efficacy. The belief that I as an individual and we as a group of people can set a goal and achieve it. When we live in under-resourced neighborhoods, we, we don't get the, we don't often have a, a very high sense of, of self-efficacy or collective efficacy. And so addressing these factors, understanding our clients' beliefs and their ability as an individual and as part of a group to accomplish something like our treatment court is something to be aware of and to, and to support. Addressing a client's sense of efficacy. Um, one thing you can do is emphasize the team nature of the program. And if you, um, and, and share with them maybe, maybe stories about individuals in similar circumstances who have succeeded in the program. And another thing that you can do, and I've seen it done in some programs, is when your clients are go to a hearing and it's time for them to go up in front of the judge, standing there with them shoulder to shoulder can convey uh, that you're part of a group that's helping them um, reach their desired outcomes. You're there supporting them as part of that collective. So a final thing I wanna talk about briefly is procedural justice. Um, clients or participants often mention the relationship with the judicial officer is a key element of their success. The judge liked me, that's why I succeeded. The probation officer didn't like me. That's why I didn't make it through the program. That's the kind of thing they say. Lots of research on procedural fairness 
in its association with success. The four components of it are, first of all, a voice. You probably heard in the staffing the story about what happened to your client over the past week, but making sure that they get a chance to tell their side of the story to the judge in court before a decision is finally made on response is something that, uh, that a way for you to advocate for them. Neutrality, um, making sure that, um, that participants understand that decisions are made based on facts um, and known rules, not on opinion, subjectivity is, is important. Um, trustworthiness, um, making sure that clients understand that the team cares about them, that they can be trusted. And, and sometimes a, a good way to earn trust with individuals, explain the rationale for decisions. Even if the decision is not a very pleasant one, um, it make it, but making sure they understand how it's going to help them. And then finally, and probably most importantly for people of color is showing respect to individuals, regarding them in a, very, in a respectful manner because participants in research have reported that um, sometimes the way people talk to them, they feel they were being disrespected. So those are all important um, aspects of procedural justice. So as an advocate, at times you can advocate for clients who have unique needs, which may be met through culturally relevant services. You may be able to identify system level changes and new client services um, to ensure equity in your program. For example, the trans individuals from the transgender community of color will need to be connected to services that are sensitive and responsive to their specific treatment need, including access to any health care that they will need. And if you get concerned that, well, if I focus on a certain group of people in my program, what, what's everyone else in the program going to think? Well, what often happens with, if, as changes are made is that what benefits some will benefit all. And so that concludes what I wanted to tell you today. And so now I um, can take questions. Thank you. I have to unmute myself first. Sorry about that, Anne. Um, I sorry. might have to have some people explain their questions or ask them, um, but Brian Norcross states, do the applications include identifiers like race, ethnicity, sex orientation, should these type of identifiers ever be considered? And if so, to what end? Those, that, yeah, so those are absolutely the kinds of identifiers I would encourage you to start recording when you look at your data to see who's getting into your program and, and how well people are doing in the program. And, and the reason we want to use identifiers like that is because they're associated with groups who have been historically discriminated against. And they're associated with groups who often come from a particular culture. So it builds our awareness of the fact that there are the, the, that history of discrimination, the history of having a culture that is distinct and may help individuals in, the, in their treatment and recovery. And finally, it helps us identify uh, resources in the community, which may, um, may be um, uh, uh, suitable for their culture. Okay. So I think, yeah, should identifiers ever be considered as part of the application? And you, you are stating yes. Yes. Um, okay. Um, Fred mentioned criminogenic. Am I saying that correctly? You you mentioned that also um, regarding veto by prosecutors, defense, and judge. Prosecutors should not have veto due to inherent bias against criminogenic clients who are high risk and high need. Predisposed relapse, reoffend are high risk offenders. Thus, prosecution is biased against them because of their criminogenic nature. Defense attorneys should not have veto due to potential conflict. Only judge should be able to veto. Statute needs to be changed. I guess this was more of a con um, comment, but do you have any thoughts on all of that, Anne? I, well, I know that um, the, the big area is, 
is um, violent history. And, and, and there's some, um, there's, there's some, people have strong um, opinions about whether or not individuals with violent history should be admitted to programs. And of course, at the federal level for federal funding, sometimes you can't have a violent history. And, and I know that NADCP is working to, um, working with federal agencies to get them to change that because what we found through the research is that individuals with a violent history given the right kind of treatment, um, they do very well in our programs. The fear is, of course, that an individual with a violent history will come in our program, they're on community supervision, and they go out and commit another violent act. And the, the research is not backing that up. Okay, that's good to know. Um, one more question. I know we're we're just a minute over, but do you have any statistics for Native American defendants or treatment cart participants? Yeah, I don't. I that has been honestly, and I know that, and I was aware, you know, talking to Montana that that would be a group that you all would be interested in. There's a whole another um, um, segment of at the national level who are um, working with the Native American population, and there are statistics available. And um, there's a lot of research on tribal wellness courts. And I'm sorry, I I just don't have that information available, but it is out there. Okay, what would it be? Would it would it be safe to say it, the statistics are probably similar to the other groups? I would, I, I, I hesitate um, to say that, but I, I just don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, Roberto, I'll let you ask a question here, um, but we are going over time. I'll make it quick. And it's not really a question. It's more of a comment on what we were just talking about. There's lots of problems with any statistics related to Native Americans. There's no actual model for uh, mental health evaluations. I learned this the hard way. All my psych evaluations for my Native clients were coming back as antisocial because they mm -hmm. communicate differently and there's no model for that. And so even if there's some kinds of statistics, they're, they're, they're not true because of those built-in systemic biases against culture of all kinds, but certainly with Natives and most of the courts in Montana, first of all, we have rural poor and then we have natives. I practice in the ninth, which is bordering against the Blackfeet reservation and we have a lot of natives and the system, I mean, I think people are trying, but we don't have a lot of things in place that we need in place to make this work better for those particular, that particular group. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Anne, very much. Um, is it okay if I get your PowerPoint and um, post it for everyone and give your, I believe I already sent out your email address for questions, if that's okay. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll have to check with the National Center. Um, we often don't share our PowerPoints, but I will find out. Okay. Okay. Just let me know about that. And thank you very much. That was very informational. Thank you. Good, good. All right. Goodbye. Okay. Um, okay, 145. We've got um Jeff Kushner up and he's got his um he's sharing his screen. So Jeff, I'll let you go ahead. Oh, Jeff, if you're talking, are you there, Jeff? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, am I muted? Is that the problem? I can't unmute. No, we can hear you. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah, go go ahead and start. We're we see your you're sharing your screen. We see that. So go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's um, amazing that we have so many of you on the line, and uh, uh, appreciate it. 
very much. We've had good presentations so far, and uh, I wish we'd have had more information on <clears throat> on our Native American population because that's uh, that's where we have focused uh, a fair amount in trying to help them uh, with their healing to wellness courts as well as with with our adult drug courts. Uh, in this session, I want to describe for you a statewide grant that has been awarded to the Office of the Court Administrator, why we submitted the application and the progress we've made to date in implementing it. I think this fits well within the presentation we just had, um, although it's it, it's not mentioned by uh, our previous presenter, but rural states, you know, have a problem in just people being able to access a drug court within close proximity. And that's um, what I wanna spend time talking about uh, today. Um, as this slide indicates, Montana has the third lowest population density in the country. That means in many places, services are hard to come by due to distance. We certainly have difficult driving conditions at times of the year. Uh, according to most data, our substance abuse problem in Montana is as high or higher than the national averages. And we have eight judicial districts, at least eight, and 23 counties without coverage for an adult drug court. Where we have tried to implement drug courts in some low population district problems, in keeping them because of the volume and the cost effectiveness. And so we came to the conclusion that we cannot justify having an adult drug court in every judicial district, yet we wanna provide equal access to Montana citizens. And so we should try using teleservices to provide that access. So approximately two years ago, we submitted a statewide grant to the Bureau of Justice Assistance to initiate two projects. The first one was to provide evidence-based treatment services across the state so that in the smaller judicial districts where treatment capability may be lacking, at least to get an intensive outpatient level of care, that we would provide three curricula and those evidence-based curricula include the matrix, which is the only NIDA approved curriculum so far, uh, approved by, again, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Seeking Safety, which is a trauma and substance abuse manualized curriculum, and moral recognition therapy. Um, these are being now broadcast by um, Boyd Andrew out of Helena across the state every week on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. They can be accessed by any drug court participant. The second effort is to implement a hub and spoke system to provide treatment court access to those districts where there is no adult drug court and expand medically assisted treatment services as well in those jurisdictions. We are also interested in providing teleservices in those large geographic districts where distances are an extensive problem as well. The funded application provides funds for a web-based training and technical assistance program and the hiring of a part-time position we hired this part-time position and found out in the last week that he's taken another job. So we're, we're looking for a, a person to, uh, to take over that responsibility. We also are gonna evaluate this effort by integrating teleservices specific evaluation to our uh, statewide management information system. And lastly, we're going to school. We're going to school using much of the forms and policies and procedures that were developed by Judge Nisley uh, and Fred Snodgrass uh, in uh, in their teleservices effort. They've been doing teleservices 
successfully now for a couple of years. To date, we've developed the forms that you see on the screen. Um, a teleservices participant contract. These are all models. They can be taken and utilized any way the local drug court wants to transform them. There's a referral form, a medical contract, a screening packet, teleservices general information, teleservices technology assessment for the participant, and a technology assessment for the court that is receiving uh, the participant from out of their jurisdiction. These forms were reviewed by um, a prosecutor and, uh, and Fred reviewed them as well. And so they are available. If you are in a judicial district where there is no adult drug court uh, and you run across a candidate who would be a, a possible uh, drug court participant uh, in an adjacent uh, district where there is a drug court. If you'll contact us, we'll help you in whatever way we can to provide access to an adult drug court, a veterans drug court, a DUI drug court, any adult type drug court, we will try and help you um, with transitioning that person uh, to an adjacent drug court where there, where we have, uh, you know, a, a drug court judge and a drug court team. We expect that your analysis testing and treatment, as well as um, supervision, will be done in the judicial district where the referral is being made, uh, and we'll help set that up as well if we need to. And that's pretty much what I wanted to go over, Kelly, with uh, the group today for teleservices. Okay, great. Um, we have time for any questions for Jeffrey, if anyone has any questions about the teleservices program. Let's see. I don't see any hands being raised or anything in the chat. So thank you, Jeffrey. That's sure. all great news. And we'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll have our last um, session with Marie Lane again. So we'll see you back in 15 minutes. Thank you.
Kelly, can you tell me who's giving this presentation? Yes, this will be Marie Lane again. Oh, okay, so she's already got access. She's on. Yeah, thank you. No, nope, no problem.
Okay, well, I've got 215, so I think we'll get started here again. Um, Marie, so happy to have you back again this afternoon. And um, I think Jeffrey will be presenting part of this. Is that correct? Um, well, I'm uh, part of the end is slated. I'm going to hand it over to to yes to um, Jeffrey to discuss the Montana peer review process. Okay. Well, go ahead, Marie. I'll hand it over to you, and we'll get going. All right. Well, thank you again. Um, my name is Marie Lane. Um, as you can see from the first slide of this presentation, this presentation was actually put together by a colleague of mine, Aaron Arnold, who's the Chief Development Officer. He usually does the constitutional legal pre uh, presentations at conference, um, does a great job. Um, so he was unable to join us today. So he so kindly allowed me to use his presentation so I can deliver it. Now, admittedly, I cut it down a little bit uh, just for time constraints. When he presents this at conference, um, it's it's um, a lot more extensive. It's a much longer presentation. And likewise, in um, in September for our, our four day defense attorney training, he'll be there and he's actually doing this in two parts. So it's really gonna be an in-depth look at the constitutional legal issues. But um, I wanna thank him for allowing me to use his presentation and we'll get started. All right, so um, sometimes we have a disparity in what the research, research shows regarding uh, what are the best practices for us to be using um, for our, our treatment courts and what the courts have been ruling um, and providing us um, in regarding case law. So sometimes um, we'll have a disparity um, in the constitutional case law and our best practices. Uh, most notably, I would say is, um, first of all, comes to mind is MAT, um, and we're gonna um, talk about that shortly, as well as preventive detention, although we're not talking about preventive detention specifically, um, in this presentation, but sometimes we get a conflict, but we know that as our role of defense attorneys that we make the arguments, right? That we preserve the record and allow our appellate um, colleagues to kind of move the ball further down the field for us. All right, so some of the um, issues we're gonna talk about first are eligibility. So in a lot of jurisdictions, um, the practical reality is that we have to limit the number of people we can take into our programs, right? Because um, we don't have um, the, the resources or the court time or the staff to be able to take everybody um, that we'd like to take. So the practical considerations is, is we have to uh, narrow our programs down based upon charges and criminal history. Uh, risk and need, preferably we're taking those high risk, high need people because those are the people we really need to target. Um, the availability of appropriate treatment services, who do we have the, the, um, the ability to take and again, our overall capacity. How much court time do we have? How much time do we have from, from probation, uh, the prosecutor's office, the public defender's office? Which then brings up some constitutional um, uh, considerations because uh, we are a court program. We are a government program. Um, they, there will be equal protection considerations that arise as well as um, issues with the Americans with Disability Act. All right, so going back to, uh, hastening you back to the days of law school and con law 101. And again, because we're a government program, um, the we're going to invoke the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, which, you know, which accordingly says that um, we need, um, Fourth Amendment requires to treat similarly situated individuals in a like manner. So that will bring up the three tests when it comes to Equal Protection Clause. Remember, we have strict scrutiny, which is uh, involves a fundamental right or a suspect class for um, most notably race, religion, national origin, alienage. And when we're dealing with a suspect class, um, the government must show that the law or practice serves a compelling state interest and is narrowly tailored to serve that interest. And then we have in the intermediate scrutiny, the semi-suspect class, such as gender. Um, in those cases, the, um, uh, the, the government must show a important state interest that is substantially related to that interest. And then for all other cases, 
it's a rational basis, which means that if the law or the or the rule um, serves a legitimate government purpose. So common equal protection challenges when it comes to our treatment courts is I want treatment court, but they won't let me in, or I want treatment court, but my jurisdiction doesn't have one. So um, I know Fred mentioned this earlier, but the courts are, are, are rule are, are holding generally that there is, um, and consistently, that there is no fundamental right to uh, participate um, in, in, a, in a treatment court. And likewise, individuals with drug offenses, they are not a suspect class. So we're talking about a rational basis um, for excluding, um, excluding individuals. So again, a rational basis would be we don't have sufficient treatment um, for um, those uh, for a particular individual, it's a public safety issue. We're not taking in sex offenders, something um, uh, to that effect. Bottom line is most equal protection challenges related to treatment court el eligibility will fail um, if, how, unless, however, you're, you're talking about a suspect class. So, unless it's a policy or practice that specifically pointed to race, ethnicity. Um, gender, religion, or alienage, um, these are presumptively, those are presumptively uh, unconstitutional, which then brings up the issue of alienage. So that is the, uh, the status, um, person's status of a non-citizen. So alienage is a suspect class requir requiring strict scrutiny. Therefore, a ban on non-citizens entering treatment court would be impermissible. However, what about those who immigrate illegally? Um, illegal um, immigrants are not a suspect class and then are subject to the rational basis review. So can treatment courts, uh, courts exclude those who immigrate illegally? Um, yes, if there is a legitimate government purpose for excluding them. Um, and here's an example. Now, I, I'd also like to know that the cases that are in this presentation aren't all inclusive, right? Um, I would refer you again to the NDCI uh, case law tab. These are just examples um, provided to you, but they're not all inclusive. So for example, here is a case from 2003 um, that um, uh, prohibiting this particular individual from participating served a legitimate government purpose because um, it, there was a substantial likelihood that the um, potential participant um, would be deported. All right, fees and fines. We've talked about that a few times today. Um, um, can a treatment court um, exclude a person because they can't afford fines or fees? It is not, um, it's not holding out to be a violation of equal protection per se. But courts generally across the country are holding that it is impermissible to deny um, uh, the ability to participate um, for an inability to pay. Uh, for more information about, um, um, as a resource about program fees and ability to pay, here is a, um, um, a document um, from OGP with the link you can refer to. Can a treatment court exclude a person because of a physical or mental health condition? Generally, yes, if it is if it serves a legitimate government purpose. Um, for example, in this, um, this particular case here, that um, there was no equal protection violation because the, pro um, the program didn't have, in this case, the lack of resources to handle serious mental health issues or some other um, medical um, related uh, resource. But um, there always needs to be considerations regarding the Americans with Disability Act, which we're um, gonna cover um, here very shortly um, because substance use disorder is a recognized disability um, for the ADA. Um, Marie? Yes? You have a question on that, that slide. Um, okay. does the does the inability to pay include lack of adequate transportation or communication facility? Mm 
mean, inability to pay for for transportation, like bus passes, or I think I, I guess I'm confused by the question. Um, I think it was talking about um, the inability to pay fines and fees. Is there anything to do with the in inability to pay for transportation? I don't know. Mark, do you want to? Right, Explain your question more. You know, if a person can't afford the fine or the fee, mm -hmm. uh, and they also don't have, say, they don't have a car and they live, you know, 90 miles away from court, um, is that a financial disadvantage or is that just the brakes? No, I would, well, first of all, we would argue as defense attorney, right? That that is a financial situation, right? Because of the of the um, of his indigence, um, he's having those transportation difficulties. Um, that that is um, require, uh, creating um, a disparity. Um, uh, again, it's an equity and inclusion issue, and um, I would make the argument that he was being um, um, prohibited um, unconstitutionally for for and entering the program. There's a lot of case law. Again, the case law that's mentioned in here is just some, some, some bullet points. Um, and I'll show you the tab here again shortly. The NDCI case law tab, that is a great resource if you just need a quick look um, on what courts across the country are, are holding. And you can go, you can go specifically to, to uh, fines and fees and, and, and look at the um, the case law um, under that tab. I know courts generally are across the country are, are beginning to hold, uh, you know, more and more are holding that you can't hold people back for the failure to, to pay fines and fees. I will just tell you, like, for example, in Ohio, where I am, um, the Ohio Supreme Court um, several years ago really started coming down on courts um, telling them, you know, uh, fines and fees aren't your court's personal ATMs, all right, that you cannot preclude people from, from completing your programs um, or getting off of supervision from probation because they have not um, completed um, their fines, um, paid their fines and fees when they, when they legitimately cannot do so, okay? Um, now, and you can give them other alternatives, like to pay off of community service. But if there is an inability to pay, um, you cannot hold somebody back for that. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, excluding somebody um, because they take a prescribed medication. Generally, yes, if there is a legitimate um, government purpose, okay? For example, if somebody is um, has chronic pain and there is an inability to, through drug testing, to really monitor um, the use um, of, the, of, of the pain medication when it comes in conjunction um, with treatment or recovery, that would be um, a legitimate um, government purpose. But again, we need to always keep in mind um, the ADA and some of the actions that um, the Justice Department has been starting to take, which we'll talk about. All right, medical marijuana. This is a biggie. This is one um, that uh, sees a lot uh, to NADCP, a lot of questions about. So I posted here, um, this is a download that just came out in October. The, you can see up at the top, ndcite.org um, marijuana fact. Um, this uh, explains the status of medical marijuana and treatment courts from around the country. Um, you know, we know that Marijuana is still a um, unlawful controlled substance as far as the feds are concerned. Uh, many states are passing medical marijuana laws. Many states courts, high courts have ruled that in some, in some of their states, um, because it's in the statute, um, the medical marijuana, that they have to be permitted um, access into treatment courts or be permitted to use marijuana um, while on probation. So if you wanted uh, a nice read, uh, a handy uh, fact sheet regarding the status of medical marijuana around the country, um, I would suggest that you um, download this, print it off.
Okay, so uh, medication for addiction treatment. So I talked about at the beginning that, some, that there has been over the years some conflict between best practices and, um, and uh, constitutional case law. Well, this was an example. So for, you know, NADCP has always recommended the use of MAT because um, it was as a recognized um, proven method of assisting our clients. But there has been case law that says that is upheld that yes, drug courts, um, you know, treatment courts can order somebody off of medication um, before they complete the program um, or, um, or order a certain type of, of, of medication. So that had been case law um, that previously we were dealing with. But now the U.S. Department of Justice has been stepping in and um, suing some states under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So Pennsylvania. So in February of 22, Pennsylvania was informed by the DOJ that they had received, received complaints um, that they were, PA was requiring drug court participants. They had to discontinue all MAT or they could not successfully complete their programs. They had to get off all MAT in order to be deemed successfully completed of probation supervision. So they, Department of Justice informed PA, hey, um, we think you're discriminating against def defendants on the basis of disability and the violation of the Disability Act. And we made, they made demands about um, adopting written policies that they weren't going to do that. They weren't going to just, they weren't going to discriminate against qualified individuals with an opioid use disorder and train all core staff on the ADA requirements. The status is that PA ignored them and uh, did not respond. So the DOJ has filed a lawsuit against um, them in federal court. Massachusetts, um, in Massachusetts, um, they were requiring um, that their participants um, um, use only Vivitrol. That yes, we allow MAT, uh, but it has to be Vivitrol, so that you know, because we want to be able to more closely monitor, we they can come in and take a shot. So, and a, a complaints were filed um, with the DOJ, and they entered into an agreement, the state of Massachusetts, that they were no longer going to do that. Right, that doctors um, determine the type of MAT that is appropriate. So, there are going to be um, the type of medication is based upon individualized assessments. Um, they cannot, the state agree, they will no longer mandate any type of specific medication. Again, a doctor determines that and that they would do um, training for all board members, parole officers, and other staff. And this was from December of 21. In addition, there has been some new federal case law regarding our clients being incarcerated um, in uh, local jails. Um, for violations when they had been on MAT and they were gonna be denied access um, while incarcerated. So here is one from 2018 um, that uh, court granted preliminary injunction finding a likely violation of the ADA because um, the jail will not allow this individual to um, continue on her methadone um, while in custody. And here's another one again, uh, um, uh, again, was um, facing a potential sentence in jail. The jail would not allow her to continue the MAT. Um, and the court ruled that the jail's denial of necessary medication was, um, uh, was a violation of the ADA. So the jail was ordered to provide um, the defendant with the, uh, with the medication. So um, um, cases are coming back around. Um, the case law is turning back towards the towards the recommendation of MAT and the best practice standards. So what's the bottom line? Is that um, with the recent DOJ enforcement and some uh, additional recent federal cases, strong indication that denying MAT is a violation of the Americans with Disability Act. So the recommendation is never deny it when proper, properly prescribed and that's the caveat that it needs to be properly prescribed. So uh, our clients just can't say, oh, you know, um, I went to so-and-so, I got a Suboxone, um, I, I got some Suboxone. Um, well, who is this doctor? Is, is the doctor regular, it's seeing you? 
there are prescription um, uh, requirements. So it needs to be properly uh, prescribed um, by a treating physician. All right, here uh, for more information about MAT and the American Disability Act, um, here is another, um, another resource for you um, if you like to refer. All right, uh, admission. Um, we know that our clients uh, traditionally, when, the, when they are um, entering a plea of guilty, waive several constitutional rights. Um, you know, the right to trial, the right to, con um, the right to confront witnesses, the right against self-incrimination self and the right to appeal. And waiver is absolutely permissible, right? When it's done knowingly, intelligently and voluntarily. But there are some special considerations for treatment courts that um, have been coming out in case law. So for example, in kitchens, that um, uh, the waiver appeal does not foreclose appellate review of due process claim um, for future violations, okay? So um, you enter into a program that conceivably could take years. Um, you were under the jurisdiction of um, uh, supervision and under the court, and there could be absolutely be future due process um, violations um, that could, could occur. Um, that could allegedly occur and that you cannot um, waive, knowingly and voluntarily, intelligently waive a future um, violation of those rights. Um, can a treatment court participant required to waive the right to termination hearing? Generally, no. Um, uh, again, um, you cannot waive your right to contest a future action um, on part of uh, future allegation misconduct. Um, you can't waive it when you'd have no, you don't have advanced knowledge of what those allegations are going to be. Can treatment courts require participants to submit to warrantless searches or random searches um, across the country consistently? Um, yes, in post plea treatment courts. Um, it's been consistently, consistently held across the country that when individuals enter a plea of guilty and are placed in any type of supervision, they have a lower expectation of privacy and um, can be required to submit to warrantless searches or random searches. However, I, uh, be mindful of pre-plea treatment courts, right? Um, you have not entered, you have not entered a plea of guilty. You still maintain your expectation um, of privacy. You're, you have far greater liberty interests. Um, so um, requiring, um, there's been case law requiring a um, participant in a pre-plea court uh, uh, to waive uh, consent to um, a warrantless search has been um, stricken down. There is um, some cases that talk about making a case specific finding as why um, the waiver of the search is needed. Um, and here are some examples. Again, these are all on, um, the case law tab of NDCI. Okay, participation. Can treatment courts um, mandate participation in such programs as AA or NA? No, um, consistently um, across the country um, and in the federal courts has been ruled a violation of the First Amendment um, that um, cannot require somebody to participate in those programs. You can mandate participation in self-help groups, but you can't dictate that there has to be AA, NA, or some other religious-based support group. So you can, um, you, can, um, you can mandate support groups, but you have to give a secular alternative such as smart recovery. Um, um, these are other um, uh, non-secular uh, support groups. Also, you cannot condition other benefits and participation in programs like AANA, okay? So you can't promise increased visitation um, with your children um, as a result of attending AA or NA. Marie, could I ask you a question on that? Yeah. Considering um, the lack of resources in uh, a 
big part of our state. Um, what if AA is the only thing? What if they order, they don't order AA or NA, but they say a self-help group, but there's no self-help groups available, but AA or NA, then that, then they can't require it. Would, would that be correct? Well, there ha okay, so first of all, um, NADCP recommends that clients not be ordered to do self-help groups, that actually self-help self -help groups should be something um, that is a treatment recommendation and the participant engages in because it's part of their treatment plan, all right? But if the court does mandate some type of, of self-help group, they can't require that it has to be AA or NA. So it could be, for example, um, a church, um, um, some type of, of um, it, it could be a, a church organization. Um, you know, we're, we're um, Jeff was, you know, talking earlier about the technology, you know, it can be something online. There are a lot of self-support groups now that you can do virtually um, and get into um, and, 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 you know, do online groups and do them virtually, even, you know, um, and you know, that was a big part for all of us during COVID, right? That a lot of um, our participants who engaged in support groups did it virtually and they ended up loving it because they could tend, you know, they could attend a group in another state um, in, in all, all varying times of the day. So it gave them a lot more options. So they can always do um, a verified support group virtually. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, can a treatment court prohibit a person from going to certain locations? Yes, if the restriction is reasonably related to the participant's rehabilitation needs and narrowly drawn. So you wanna consider the geographic size of the area that you wanna prohibit the participant from entering, whether it's a compelling need for them to even enter that area and whether a supervised entry um, to that area is feasible. So some examples, um, here's a case, um, um, you know, where prohibiting entrance in the French Quarter uh, was was upheld, knowing that it's a small geographic area and this area for now for prostitution, and that that was the that was the offender's charge. Um, but here is um, State versus Wright um, from Ohio, where in, you know, invalidating a probation term that prohibited entry to any place where alcohol is served or consumed, it was just an ambiguous condition, it was overbroad, you know, not going any place where alcohol is served or consumed, well, that could be, um, you know, that's every, that's any gas station, that's every grocery store. Um, so if you really are trying to, uh, in that case, narrowly tailor it, you wanna say um, any, um, um, any business where the sale of alcohol is the primary um, source of business, so a bar. But you can't have this ambiguous just generally um, where alcohol is served in general. Can a treatment court prohibit a person from association associating with specific individuals? Yes, that the restriction is reasonably related to the participant's rehabilitation needs and narrowly drawn, but you, um, you must be specific. So for example, um, you know, conditioning, here's an example of condition prohibiting defendant from associating with any known member of the criminal street gang is permissible, but prohibiting from associating with any known member of a disruptive group was just too overbroad. You're not put on notice of who, who you know, who those people are. Um, here's another example of upholding a condition uh, barring um, an individual association with neo-Nazis and skinheads. Incidental conduct um, is not enough to revoke um, your probation. So reversing um, a defendant's revocation, which was based on association with formerly incarcerated individuals who worked at the same restaurant was just overly broad. It was incidental conduct. So just because I have a job um, at a, say at a restaurant um, where other formerly incarcerated individuals are also employed, that incidental conduct is not enough um, it, it's it's um, um, not enough to, um, it's, it's not a valid restriction. Um, and, and also too, here's another case where finding that the condition um, applied to association with gang members had to be known to the defendant. You maybe have to be on notice. So if I don't know 
that you are a member of another gang, um, then how do I know that I just stay with it, away from you? So um, incidental conduct um, is not enough to, is not sufficient. Restrictions on association with spouse, they're subject to heightened scrutiny. Um, so here are um, some examples of um, um, spousal restrictions. They must be based on an indiv indiv individualized determination that a restriction is needed to promote the de defendant's rehabilitation and the scope of the restriction must be narrowly tailored and, and no more restrictive than necessary. Um, here was a case that upheld um, a condition that prohibited um, an individual from living with her husband because it might interfere with her rehabilitation. Um, and another case, likewise, where the absolute prohibition from associating with any person ever convicted of a crime, including her husband, was an invalid infringement on her liberty. Clothing. Sometimes this comes up um, as a violation of the First Amendment um, um, uh, right to uh, expression and freedom, a uh, freedom of speech. Um, can a treatment court impose restrictions on participants' clothing? Yes, um, if it's reasonably related to the offense and preventing future criminality, but you have to give, it has to be specific enough that you're giving a participant adequate notice of what kind of dress is permitted and what is prohibited. So just having a general restriction um, that you can't have clothing that may connote affiliation or membership in a specific gang. It was overly vague. Um, you have to give somebody, uh, put somebody a specific notice of, of the clothing um, that is prohibited. All right, can a treatment court um, require a participant to get a job? Yes, um, they can require a good faith effort um, to get a job. So the cases have upheld that um, you can um, uh, uh, try to sanction for a, a lack of good faith in, in, in seeking employment. Um, um, there are obviously legitimate issues every day where people, especially our clients, are unable to get employment because of other substance use issues, mental health issues, or because of the significance of their criminal background. So they can require good faith efforts um, to secure uh, employment, but not be punitive to the um, not the, their inability to actually obtain faithful employment. Can you treat, uh, prohibit a participant from getting cert certain types of jobs? Yes, uh, when the restriction is reasonably related to the crime and the goals um, of probation. So the examples here. Um, uh, barring a uh, probationer from working in the medical field, following a conviction for you know fraudulently obtaining prescription medication. Um, another one um, found that the a condition prohibiting someone um, an offender from continuing to work as a pharmacist on the grounds um, that it was overly broad rather than rehabilitative, which means it was not specifically related to his real rehabilitation needs and goals. So for example, for us, um, somebody with a substance use disorder uh, could be prohibited um, from working, say, in a, as a bartender, okay? Because it is directly in, in conflict with the, the uh, rehabilitative needs, as an example. All right. Staff meetings. Staff meetings are typically you know, held outside of regular court sessions. They are informal, off the record meetings. They are for the team to share information about clients and to prepare for the formal status hearings. But most importantly, they are not for making formal findings or decisions, okay? Yes, a judge, yes, things are, are discussed. And yes, a judge can indicate how they anticipate they may rule. Um, um, you know, barring any additional uh, information, but formal findings cannot be made um, in these staffings. So when conducted properly, normal due process rights do not apply to staff meetings, okay? You're not, so the defendant is not entitled to be present and it need not be open to the public or the record. But again, that's as long as, um, um, it doesn't begin to resemble a traditional court proceeding. 
So no formal decisions are made um, in those staffings or uh, due process rights do, do occur. So probation officer isn't gonna leave a staffing and go place one of your participants in handcuffs and take them to the jail, right? All formal decisions have to happen on the record. Um, again, here are some cases finding that again, as long as there, no liberty interest is impacted, um, they, the staffings um, can be closed and um, due process, um, 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 they don't need to have a public record. They do not need to be open to the public. There's other case law that discusses that um, staffings are very similar to pretrial conferences, right? Where the, the attorneys are with the judge in the office and um, uh, issues and legal issues and other issue, evidentiary issues are discussed, but no formal findings are made. Um, so there are cases that equate staffings um, to those as well. There are some cases that um, set some that sanctions can be imposed without a formal hearing or uh, full due process hearing when they're intermediate sanctions. You know, we were talking um, something less than termination um, does not involve a liberty interest. Now, interesting, this Commonwealth versus Nicely, which hold um, the elements of due process required for probation revocation were not required for treatment court sanction. Um, because treatment court participants waive those rights. What's misleading about that is because the participants did get their due process rights because they were actually um, in that situation required to file a formal probation violation. So that's where the due process rights um, uh, kicked in. So they really did get the due process rights in the form of a formal probation, uh, probation revocation hearing or violation hearing, as opposed to the context of a treatment court sanction. Um, there are some other cases, um, um, like for example, Brookman requires, anytime you have a, a sanction hearing and there's a disagreement um, as that the participant wants to dispute it, you go full blown and you have a due process hearing um, in the treatment court. The recommended approach of um, NADCP is um, when there is a dispute as to the allegation um, that's going to be sanctioned that you give the you give the participant the, the right to be represented by counsel, the right to testify, right to cross-examine witnesses, and the right to to call his or her his or her own witnesses. All right, termination. Uh, due process protections are required whenever a defendant faces the possible loss, loss of a recognized liberty interest. Freedom from jail is certainly a liberty interest, so due process is required for treatment court termination. Um, what is due process? Our um, courts have spelled that out for us. Um, I know Fred mentioned earlier about um, what Montana state law has regards to that. Um, these are the, the normal, normal requirements for, for due process. Um, can um, an offender waive a determination hearing as a condition of entering treatment court? Generally, it's been holding on as no, because again, you cannot waive um, knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily waive a future allegation. Um, I don't know what it is in Montana, uh, preponderance of the evidence, in Ohio is clear and convincing, whatever your state um, holds as the, as the level of of, of evidentiary burden um, for traditionally a probation violation, um, that would be the standard of evidence. Cases have generally, all, uh, courts across this, the country have also been holding that, you know, like probation violation hearings, um, hearsay is, um, is admissible when it would not be admissible in like in a court trial um, or traditional uh, criminal uh, proceeding. Um, but, you know, they, there has to be some evidence of reliability that they can't just rely solely um, on hearsay for the termination. Can the treatment court judge preside over the termination and sentencing hearing? Um, after all, every defendant facing termination or sentencing is entitled to a neutral and detached a magistrate. Um, there is split authority on this issue. I don't know if Montana 
has ruled in on that. Most jurisdictions have been taking a case by case approach um, that that's up to the judge, whether the judge um, um, uh, believes that um, under the circumstances can be fair and impartial, but the mere fact that the judge presided over the termination um, was also the drug court judge is not enough by itself to require um, recusal. Now, other states have taken a different approach. Um, some states have um, made it a blanket rule that they require, um, require recusal when the defendant asks for it. The NAD, NADCP's recommended approach is that you grant it, um, that if the, um, if the participant um, wishes um, a different judge to hear the matter, um, that a motion um, be filed and that it be granted. Here are some additional resources. Uh, the Drug Court Judicial Bench Book is a great resource. There is the, um, again, it's on the NDCI website. Again, a reference to the, the case law tab. Um, it's continually updated and kept up to date. Great resource if you're just looking for, um, you know, see what people around this, how the courts are ruling around the state. Um, some other documents, again, the, uh, from the Legal Action Center. Um, a couple of publications, because um, we didn't address it at all, um, confidentiality, uh, the 42 CFR2 and the HIPAA, um, some great uh, resources there. I will also tell you on the horizon, um, just like the, the, the critical issues for defense attorneys is a, um, about to come out as an update. There's also a publication in the works that will be out, I anticipate absolutely this year, that um, is in conjunction with the NADCP and the Center for Court Innovation, um, Innovation that is going to be a, um, it's a constitutional and legal issues guidebook for treatment courts. And I've had the opportunity to read a draft of it. It's fabulous. It's very deep diving. It's, it's almost a hundred pages. Um, so it's gonna be a great resource when that comes out. And we anticipate that this year. Uh, as I told you, Aaron is the one um, that developed this presentation and he um, does this presentation quite a bit um, like more expansive. So um, this slide has his um, has his um, contact information. Um, if you ever wanted to um, shoot any of your legal questions to him, I'm sure he, he'd be happy to happy to assist. So having that, um, I will end this part of the, the presentation um, and handing the baton over to, to Jeff to talk about the um, peer review process. If he's there. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. And I'll try to be brief and talk about um, Montana's peer review process for drug courts. Um, there's always interest in how drug courts are evaluated and monitored. And um, we find that to be the case true with the legislature. And um, as a result of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals and Doug Marlowe bringing together the researchers, they developed volume one and volume two of the best practice standards. And are you able to hear me, Kelly? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, are you able to see the screen? Yep, we see your screen. Oh, okay, all right. I'm not sure I know how I'm going to forward the screen. Let's see. <laughs> Kevin, are you on? I'm not controlling my mouse. I am on, Jeff. Yes. Oh, okay. No wonder I couldn't control the mouse. I'm trying to get you to see your stuff here. All right. Anyway, you're fine. Anyway, so uh, 
NADCP developed volumes one and volume two of the best practice standards. In Montana, we took those standards and we developed a peer review process, actually in conjunction with the state of Idaho. And as a result of that, um, there, we have three objectives that we uh, are trying to achieve with our peer review process. The first thing, of course, is that we want to align Montana drug courts as best we can with national standards and the evidence-based practices that are outlined there. Uh, if you were on early this morning, you heard Carolyn Harden talk about some of those standards. For example, um, that the entire team attends staffing and the entire team attends drug court. Um, that there be at least two urinalysis tests a week. Um, that we have no more than two treatment providers and preferably one treatment provider. There's a whole set of standards based on the research that are in volume one and volume two. And so we want to align our drug courts with those standards. The second thing we want to do is create a learning community among drug court team members. And so we had over 50 people that we trained to do peer review uh, about a year and a half ago. And so we call upon those people to help us do peer review. And the third thing that we wanted to achieve is the state auditor did a performance audit of drug courts in Montana, probably, I don't know, three, four years ago. And they recommended that we uh, develop an evaluation of nationally recognized standards to achieve program goals and objectives. And so our peer review process certainly uh, does that. Our goal is to improve Montana drug court outcomes by moving them again toward utilization of evidence-based practices. Our drug court team members, except for our drug court coordinators, receive no additional financial benefit for doing drug court. They have full schedules, travel a lot, and so doing a drug court is an additional workload with no extra remuneration or benefit other than having the satisfaction of knowing that they are doing the best they can for the drug dependent defendant person in front of them. This of course is true of our public defenders as well. So we're not punitive in our process. We appreciate the fact that our team members are willing to do the extra work we will not withhold funds or be punitive regarding the results of our peer review process, but we do require an action plan with deadlines and responsible persons assigned for carrying out those action plans. Our process with each local drug court starts approximately 60 days prior to the anticipated site review with a letter to the judge and the coordinator announcing our intent to do a peer review site visit. Two days later, I send out a letter to the local drug court coordinator requesting completion of 130 question electronic survey about their drug court. They complete a cover page with additional information for site visit and requests for all their drug court documents, their manuals, their releases of information, their um, memorandums of understanding with their treatment providers. We want a copy of all of, of, of their documents. 30 days before the site review, I make sure that the online survey is complete and that NPC has done the crosswalk to take the best practice table for the peer reviewers to use on site. So we take that 130 question electronic survey and we develop a best practice table that the team uses on site. At the same time, the peer review team confirms the dates and reserved hotel rooms. Peer review team reviews materials and develops areas for deeper review while on site. Team members by phone uh, meet to finalize plans and who's gonna be responsible for what activities on the site review. The team goes on site, takes notes, has exit interviews with the team, 
tries to make sure that there are no surprises later on in the eventual report. Peer review team then drafts the report within two to three weeks after their, re after their on-site review. We send a draft to the statewide, uh, we send a draft to the judge and to the local coordinator for their final review. And then the report's finalized and sent out with an action plan format and a request for them to complete the action plan. My job then is to review the plan and to look at what assistance and training they might need to carry out their plan. The report and the action plan are posted on the Montana Drug Court website. The on-site activities include interviewing the judge, the coordinator, and all of the team members. We observe staffing. We observe status hearings. We talk with participants and have a focus group with the participants. Review and update the best practice table. We hold an exit interview before leaving, summarizing areas of concern and exemplary areas to highlight for all drug courts. So we're looking at strengths and weaknesses when we go on site and when we do the um, best practice table. We've developed a, a whole bunch of materials, of course, a peer review process overview. We have a checklist, um, task details, a uh, cover page that gets sent out to the local drug court coordinator to complete. Uh, again, I mentioned the online survey. <clears throat> we have definitions for treatment, best practice, uh, uh, the best practice table that is used to go on site with, a site review schedule and interim sign-up sheet, sample confidentiality form, questions for team member interviews. So each team member that we interview has a separate set of questions that we ask. Uh, we have interview tips, pre-court staff meeting observation forms, staff hearing observation form, tips for conducting the participant focus group, uh, focus group disclosure form template, participant questions, Exit interview guidelines, recommendations for summary reports, a summary report template, a sample peer review summary report for people to look at so they have an idea of what the peer review summary report should look like, Montana peer review uh, policy questions and answers, resources and contacts, um, consent form, points and forms, sample documents to consider to improve the process. So let you know that's a pretty extensive peer review process that we have. We're on a little bit of a hiatus right now because of the holidays and I'm gonna have some medical procedures shortly, but I would guess in the next 60 days, 30 to 60 days, we'll be doing a uh, veterans treatment court and a family treatment court and those will be the first times that we've done veterans and family drug courts. There are now new standards for family drug courts and new standards for juvenile drug courts, as was mentioned previously. I'll stop there, Kelly. Okay, um, there's one question and I'll add to it. Who are these peers and how many are there? How are they picked? What do, how, how do you get do the process of choosing and picking the peers. There are some public def there are some public defenders. There are a few prosecutors. There are mostly local drug court coordinators. There are treatment uh, professionals. Um, there are from primarily members of drug court teams. And we trained them, there were about 56 or 57 that we trained, oh, again, it's been about a year and a half ago, NPC and I trained them uh, in a day long uh, training. Um, and so as we schedule peer reviews, we call different people, um, try to get them somewhat close geographically 
but they are primarily team members from drug court teams. Okay. Um, and then I, I thought I heard you say, so family treatment courts also get peer reviewed? Yes, there, there are new standards, fairly new standards for family treatment courts. I happen to be on the state, uh, the national review committee that developed them. And so for the first time, we now have a best practice table for family drug courts. And uh, in the next 60 to 90 days, we'll be doing our first family drug court. Oh, okay. So you haven't done a peer review of Not of one. a family drug court. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions for either Marie or Jeffrey? Um, Marie is still on here. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Marie. Um, and thank both of you. Um, again, this was very, very helpful. Um, let me look, Marie, and make sure there's... Um, Kelly, I just want to thank NDCI and Carolyn and Marie. Um, they really did the hard pulling on getting this together. And uh, uh, anytime we ask NDCI for help, we, we always seem to get it. And it's very high quality. We have a lot of training on our website that's a result of our biennial conference that can be accessed by public defenders and other team members and uh, would be glad to provide that website to you as well. Yeah, I agreed. Thank you, Marie. And I don't know that um, Fred and Carolyn's not here um, or Ann, but um, thank you so much, Marie. I know you put a lot of time into Put, putting this on too, so thank you. Uh, well, it's our pleasure. Um, we're always happy to always happy to assist, and I'm I'm always like thrilled to to be with my peeps with the public with the defense attorney. So it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're three minutes away, so um, we're on time again. One last call for any questions. All right, well, um, I will do my best to collect uh, presentation materials um, and get the recording and work on making this available to others that may have missed it or missed parts of it today. So thank you, Marie. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Kevin and Aaron for helping on the Zoom side of things and have a good rest of your day. <laughs>